morning. We're just going to start with a prelude this morning, praise. So feel free to keep mingling amongst yourselves, but also just prepare your hearts for our worship service this morning. Isabel Letter. I'm the associate director here at Central, or associate director of student and family ministries here at Central. Sorry, it's a long title. Um, if you are new, welcome. We'd love to get to know you here on staff, so please find one of us and be sure after worship to head out to our welcome center and meet Kirsten out there, and she has a little gift for you, so be sure to introduce yourself. Um, I'd like to also remind you of your connection cards that are in your pews. We love to pray for you throughout the week as staff, so remember to fill out those with any new information for yourself or prayer requests and drop them in the globes as those are passed during offering. 
And then also just a reminder of our child care that's offered. Anyone birth through three years can go to our child care room, and then three years through fourth grade will be dismissed to Pathfinders in a little bit, and they come out with me. Um, if you are not registered or signed up, just come find me at that time, and we'll get them grooving for the day. Our first event is about our Discover Central class, which is this coming Tuesday at 6.30. So if you are new or newer and want to learn more about us, sign up for that class and um, come here. It's here at Central and get to know us more. So again, 6.30 this coming Tuesday the 9th. Then we have our next She event, which She Night Out is May 2nd, so we're super excited, ladies. It's going to be an awesome night. you got to get your outfits ready because it's Roaring Twenties themed, so you better be dressed up and having fun. My one thing I will emphasize is we need you to sign up by April 18th. Um, it's a little bit early, you know, we, don't, we got busy lives and plan, but April 18th. So repeat it with me, ladies. April 18th. That's 11 days away. So you might as well just take out your phone now and go fill out the form so you don't forget because you know you'll get home and forget. So just go do it right now. Um, the next one is probably one of my bias, most favorite events coming up because it's Vacation Bible School. It's happening June 24th through the 27th. Super excited. Registrations are open. They're rolling in. We're going to get lots of kids. We always have a ton, so I'm super excited. But with that, we also need volunteers because it takes a village to wrangle those kids for that week. So if you're interested in volunteering or also sponsoring a kid, we sometimes have children who can't afford to come, but we want to make sure they are still able to be a part of that super awesome week. Um, so we do need sponsorship. So after worship, you can come out. We have a table out there. Find Ben or I. Find, sign up to volunteer or um, give some money to sponsor a child. If you're not sure at this time on your schedules or where life's at, there is also a form on our website to do both of those options as well. And also a form to register. So everything VBS, get it in your heads, get it ready. June's coming. It's going to be here before you know it, and we're super excited. All right. I'm going to invite Pastor Ryan forward. Awesome. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be with you. My name is Ryan. I'm the pastor at Central. And uh, maybe you know this already, but one of the things we love about Central is we have lots of young people at Central. And so we love having lots of young kids around. And so just so you know, too, young people are always welcome in the sanctuary. So it doesn't matter how old or young. I tell parents all the time, if they get a little bit fussy or kind of cranky, you can take them out. But bring them back in. We do have pathfinders that are on. They can go to that or they can stay here. We don't mind it. I've preached in some bizarre places where there's kids screaming and cows running around. And so and so it doesn't bother me. The kids don't bother me at all. So uh, please know that. But we also have Pathfinders. But we love to just be a people that champion and bless our young ones as well. The word benediction just means to speak good over somebody. And so it's our job, if you're not a child, to speak good over our young people. By the way, I always tell high school or college kids, if you uh, tell me you're coming, like on Sunday morning, you can give me a single word and I'll use that. It's like a challenge I have with young people. I'll use that word in my sermon. It can be any word. I mean, within bounds, right? But like any word, and I'll use it, and I, won't, I can't say, oh, I'm saying the word now because Tom told me, you know, I just, I just throw it in my sermon. You have to look, listen for it. So give me a heads up when you're coming. I'll, give you a, I'll throw a word in the sermon for you. Uh, but that being said, this is a big day for us. We have several first communicants. So we have kids that get uh, communed here for the first time around fifth grade or so. And so here's a list of all of our first communicants this morning. And so your job as the body, as the community of Central, is to celebrate these ones. They're going to come forward. They have stoles on if you see them. I tell them all the time, if they go through my line during first communion, they get a free high five today. Next week, I it's free. I keep losing connection here, but... Uh, that was a joke, by the way, but I don't really charge them money. But, but um, anyway, but that, that's our job is to rally around these young ones as they get their first communion. It's a big deal. And uh, I always tell them, hey, I say, look at me in the eyeballs. This is a big deal, big day for you. So we want to celebrate them this morning. So as you see them out and about, you know, go give them a high five or wave at them and tell them good job. And we're, we're, we love them. We're proud of them and that they're welcome here. So also, I want to just take a minute to thank Isabel and Ben. Isabel does a wonderful job with our young people. So Isabel is the one who did the announcements. Does a phenomenal job with our young people. And so thank you, Isabel. And um, if you want to help her out, they're always looking for more help and for more volunteers. And I always say, if you, if you like Jesus and you kind of can tolerate little human beings, we'll take you. And we'll train you in. And uh, so talk to Isabel if you feel like, you know, maybe like you just call or like this tug on your heart to help out with our young ones. Um, it's incredible ministry to be helping with these little ones and to help them uh, as they grow older. Okay, enough for me. I want to invite Isabel back up. So would you give Isabel some love? And... Uh, 
And we are going to invite our communicants forward in just a moment, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to hear from them. But thanks, Isabel. All right. Thank you. Am I back on? Okay. All right. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. And I am going to just start with calling off the First Communion students who are here today so that they can come forward, and we're going to recognize them. So first, we have Avery Barker. If you'd like to just come up and stand right up in front. So I'm just going to keep going down the line. We have Avery Dahl. Adeline DeBoer. You know you were next. It's, it's alphabetical up there, too. Wyatt Hageman. William Hofstead. Why don't you stand right here, because I'm shorter. So, <laughs> go in front. Uh, Evan McCarty. Maya Nast. Avery Nierengarten. Maxton Peterson. Manning Peterson. Yep, you're good. Asher. I don't know if I saw Asher Rich. There you are, buddy. Harrison Ron Strand, Zachary Shearer, Bennett Shermack, and Sophia Surma. Where is she? There she is. All right. So this morning, we have 15 students up here with us. We had three go through it last week on Monday, Thursday. So there's 18 total this year in our, that went through it in our class. So we are super excited to recognize them today. We talk a lot about the journey that they go on. First, they come and get baptized, where we make promises to them as their parents and as congregation to walk alongside them. Then they go through third grade Bible, and we put the word into their hands where they receive their Bibles. And now today they're here. They've done their homework, and they're going to receive Holy Communion for the first time. So it's a super exciting day for them and everything that they've done and learned. And I know that they are excited as students to be able to um, be here and receive communion for the first time. So as part of their homework, they made that what communion means to me statements and paragraphs. So we are going to let three of them share today that wanted to share. So first, Sophia, if you'd like to step on up. She's going to share with us first. For me, First Communion represents taking my faith a step further as I grow older. As I become more independent, my faith will guide me and help me live my life to the fullest. I believe my First Communion is symbolic of my commitment to the Christian faith. Thank you. We'll wait and applaud, or you can applaud her now. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, we can wait till the end. Go ahead. All right. Adeline, if you'd like to come up next. I don't know if you need this. She was pretty good. You're taller. You don't have to. Or if you want, you could. There you are. I want to take First Communion so I can be a better Christian and learn how to worship him. Communion to me is about getting closer to God and learning about him and what he does for me. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. Communion is about the story where we sit at the table and have bread as his body and wine as his blood. Communion is about forgiveness, and when you do something wrong, you can ask to be forgiven. Thank you. Give her some love. All right. And lastly, we're going to hear from Avery Dahl, if you'd like to step up to me. Stand up next to me. What communion means to me? Communion is also called the Lord's Supper because we eat together at church, just like Jesus did with his, his disciples. He wanted to share his meal with everyone, even if they sinned. The wafer is Christ's body, and the wine is his blood. When I take communion, it will make me feel good and closer to God. Thank you. Just kind of stand over here. All right. That was awesome. Thank you all for your hard work and everything that you've done and your parents for walking alongside you. And just thank you to the parents who've brought them through this journey and are here with them today and got them here. Last thing I'd like to acknowledge is all of their beautiful stoles that they're wearing. They did a pretty awesome job. They look awesome. That's the, what they have around their necks there. They are given the stoles, and the stoles have meanings of when you wear them, they decorated them with their God-given talents, and now they are sent into the world to share those with the rest of the world. So share their talents, share God's word. Um, that's the meaning of what the stoles are. So come check them out after worship if you haven't. They've got a lot of really cool things on there, and maybe get to know them a little bit by what their talents are. So those are awesome. Thank you. Wouldn't mind congregation reaching your hand out towards them. We're just going to pray over them quick before they go have their seats. 
Dear Lord, thank you for these students. We want to thank you for your presence in Holy Communion and that these students get to receive this wonderful gift that you have given to us. We pray that you continue to bless the lives of these students and use them and their God-given talents to glorify you in all they do. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. 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 All right, you may have your seats. Everyone else, I invite you to stand and share the peace this morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be with you guys. By the way, one of the, one of the traditions in sharing the peace is, I, man, I hate to cut everybody off from talking. I like the social, I like it, uh, is, you know, if you come into this space and for like an hour, we're going to like sort of dedicate some time to listening to God, uh, to sharing in a meal, to singing some songs and praying. And we want to allow some time, if you need to make peace with anybody in your life, if you've come into this room and you're like, hey, I've had a rift with my wife or my kid or my neighbor, you can take the time when we share the peace to go and make peace with somebody. So when you come sort of to the table and you come in here, you can kind of be burden free, if you will, in that way. And so if you've got to sneak out too in the next five minutes to go make peace, I encourage you to do that. So that was a nice opportunity to kind of go make peace with other people. Uh, that's one of our rhythms here. One of our other rhythms at Central is we like to pray together out loud. And so we're going to do that. And I want to welcome you to pray with me using these words on the screen. So we'll just follow along. We'll pray together this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, we've joyfully celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. Please help us reflect that power in all we say and do. We pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, now and always. Amen.
pray this morning. Father, we give you thanks so much for your presence here. And we do take a minute just to acknowledge that you are here with us right now and right here in this place, in this time. And God, we thank you as we gather around this meal, this celebration of your life and death and, of course, resurrection. And we think of the, uh, yeah, the life that you've offered to us, that you've come to give us life, this abundant, full quality of life. And so as we gather and we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember these things. You've come to us. I want to invite you now into our time of communion. If you're a first-time guest here this morning, I want you to know that we serve an open table, meaning that you don't have to be a member here or have to have been here before, that if you're hungry and thirsty, you can come forward and you can eat and you can drink. And I'll kind of explain how we do it, and you can just sort of follow along, and it's totally fine. But in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, it's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new, cup, uh, the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I'd like to invite the servers forward this morning if you're uh, serving communion this morning. Uh, and here's how we'll kind of do it. The ushers will come down the aisles and dismiss you one row at a time. And you can kind of follow the person in front of you. When you come forward to each station or any one of the stations, you'll receive a wafer. And uh, we also have gluten-free wafers available upon request. They're in their own little prepackaged elements with some grape juice. So if you want to have those and not worry about cross-contamination, grab one of those. Otherwise, we'll give you a wafer. And uh, you can dip that wafer in the first cup, which is the red wine, or the second cup, which is the white grape juice. And again, please know that all are welcome at the Lord's table here this morning.
heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Would you please stand? May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our blessing song over our kids. So if you're a young one and you're not already standing, would you please stand up? And if you could just turn around, if you see a young person near you, reach out your hand to them. We're going to bless them with our blessing song, and we'll use the words on the screen this morning. Let's bless our kids. And so our kids, uh, kindergarten through fourth grade, are dismissed for Pathfinders. We also have a uh, child care available out there. If you've got little, little ones want to check them in somewhere, they can do that. Or they can stay here with us. So uh, be dismissed, little ones. And please remain standing for our gospel reading this morning. Thanks, buddy. Good morning. This morning's Bible service is Matthew 4, 18 through 22, on your page 785 in your pew Bible. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James of Zebedee and his brother John, in the boat with his, their father Zebedee. He mended their pet nets and he called them immediately and they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's the ending of the reading. Amen. Thank you, Betty. You can be seated. Thank you, Betty. Well, it is my privilege this morning to introduce to you our guest speaker. We have a guest speaker. Uh, I met Kent in person for the first time last year. His name is Kent Dobson. He was uh, our tour guide over in Israel is more of a pilgrimage, really, which is why I liked, you know, why I like Kent is that uh, he's just a deep individual and thinks deeply about a lot of things. And so when we were over in Israel, there's all kinds of tours you can take over in Israel, but ours was, I feel like, a unique one. And it was more of a pilgrimage, like this spiritual journey as we journeyed in the footsteps of Jesus and other, you know, uh, these other ancient Bible stories. Uh, but before that, I actually had bought, he has, he has his own commentary on the Bible. He has like a, an NIV commentary that he did all the commentary for. His background is in biblical studies, and uh, as you'll, you'll hear a little more later on. But, um, so he's got this wealth of knowledge about the Bible, the first century especially, and uh, the Jesus stories, which were uh, phenomenal that when we were in Israel. It was great to hear from, um, from him on those, on those stories. And uh, we've become friends over the last year or so, and then yesterday he spent a whole day with us and about 25 guys out of Bob Ruprecht's house doing our guys' retreat and just did some wonderful things out there. I cannot tell you what we did. It's top secret. You have to be a guy and you have to have been there. So uh, I'm just kidding, but it was a good time to be with him. And so, yeah, I, just, I wanted to have Kent come out and speak with our guys, but also have him come share with you on Sunday morning. Because again, I think he's, his, his knowledge about the Jesus stories and ancient biblical, you know, sort of scholarship and things that are going on in these stories in the Bible, it's second to not many at all. And so it's my privilege to introduce, would you please give a warm welcome to Kent Dobson this morning. Yeah, hey everybody. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. It's nice to uh, see so many people here. Um, yeah, it's my privilege uh, to, to be a, a part of this community for today. I felt very welcomed. Um, it's such a, it's a, a lively place, which is uh, very encouraging. Because the first thing I want to say might sound a little discouraging. <laughs> when I lived in Israel, I, I moved there to graduate school um, almost 20 years ago now. 
And um, I became friends with a, with a priest there, and, and, and an Anglo, Anglican priest. And he used to say regularly, he'd say, you know, uh, Western society is moving spiritually backwards. And I thought, well, the first thing I thought was, this is kind of what old people say, you know, all right, we're moving backwards. Um, but I don't know, the, the, more, uh, dec- uh, the more years that have, have ensued since first hearing that, there's something about that phrase that our Western culture, our Western world is moving spiritually backwards that seems true to me. Like, yeah, it does seem like we've lost our, our mooring, like we're a bit adrift, and we don't know uh, what to trust anymore. Basic uh, values and decency seem to be like, you know, water running through our hands. And um, not to mention, uh, I could mention a whole bunch of really dark things, <laughs> like politics. I know that that's the, not the, the thing you're supposed to say at the beginning of the sermon, start talking about politics, but it's almost as if our political landscape has become a kind of new religion. People are clinging on to it with almost like denominational fervor and fighting. And it, it seems to be like a strange time. Almost all traditions and institutions are being uh, called into question. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. They're being questioned and pushed against and challenged. You can say, well, that's just what the next generation always does. And I say, well, perhaps, but there also seems to be something kind of that's spiritually backwards about our age. In fact, um, I flew here. I I live in Georgia now. I I used to live in Michigan. I, I just recently moved to Georgia. That's where my wife's from. And um, I was in the Atlanta airport. This is the largest airport in the world, apparently, or the busiest airport in the world. And I was sitting there on my phone. Okay, I'm not a saint. I'm sitting there on my phone. And I put, I put my phone down for a second, and I looked up, and this is a very busy airport. And I, I'm not kidding you. I could not, not find one person who wasn't on their phone. <laughs> Even the people walking. I thought, this is strange. It, the, our culture is strange right now. And the values that... that that we're promoting, like fame and glitz and whatever's quick and instant and uh, is flashy and and interesting and tantalizing and that's at our fingertips all the time and and you wonder why people feel empty, you know, you wonder why people feel empty and they're hungry for something more and it seems to be like we're in that kind of age, kind of like my friend saying, the thing about Western cultures, we're moving spiritually backwards. And you could say, okay, uh, maybe we should be concerned, and, and yeah, maybe we should be concerned. And, um, and I think about the time period of Jesus in, in light of some of this stuff, because interestingly enough, Jesus' time period, particularly the very beginning of Christianity, before it was a religion, it was just a little group of Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. It wasn't like a a formalized institution in any respect, was definitely a minority in the culture. Definitely, 100% a minority. In fact, Judaism, about the time the first Christians were starting to wander around the Roman Empire, was banned. And the Romans came in and they destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Um, I'm sure you've heard that story before. So the temple is destroyed. And then there's another war with the Jews in 135 AD. And the Jewish people themselves, not to mention all the Christians who were, who, who were more or less Jews at that point, are sort of scattered to the wind here. And Christianity is not a legal religion. For 300 years, for 300 years, people, Christians, who were followers of Jesus, that's probably as, as simple as they would have called themselves, just were followers of Jesus, this Messiah figure from Galilee. Some of them had never even been to Galilee and never met, of course, not met Jesus in person. Somehow still survived, which is interesting to me. Somehow it was attractive enough that you're sitting here, in other words. Um, you're not Jewish. I mean, maybe some of you are, you know, your, your heritage is, I don't know, but probably most of you are not. How did you end up here in this part of the world with a, with a cross and with this whole conversation and with communion, this original meal that Jesus hands off to his disciples. How is that possible? How did that happen? And the first thing I'd like to say about the how of that is it wasn't because Christians had any power. (laughs) In fact, they had zero power. I mean, of the political kind. They had zero power. 
In fact, it was something of an underground movement, something of a countercultural movement. So when I hear things like Western culture is moving spiritually backwards, I think, okay, that might not be such a good thing, but I don't know how much of a problem that is when you think about the origins of Christianity, when you think about how the thing was set up in the first place. So what I want to ask today actually comes out of the gospel reading this morning, and that is how did this movement work? What was the, I I don't mean to sound fancy, methodology. What was the methodology? That was the word Ryan gave me. i got to slip that in. (laughs) What what was the methodology used to, I don't want to say make this attractive because I don't think Christianity was like a sales job. Okay, it's not like, you know, selling used cars. But what made it interesting enough to people where they found a kind of orientation of value and a longing to be a part of this when it was illegal in the first place. And the answer to that is already right at the beginning of this scripture reading that we started with. This is how Jesus begins. He says, come follow me. That's about about as straightforward as you can get. He doesn't say, okay, wait a minute. I need you to believe five things, all right? And here's a little, you know, list, and you check them off. He says, just come and find out what I'm doing. That's it. Come follow me. And apparently, they say, okay. I know, maybe they didn't have anything better to do. They're like, fishing's boring today. Let's, you know, let's go. But that's how it begins. And we call those people the disciples. The, the passage that we just read is the calling of the disciples. Now, I want to read you briefly the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. So, just to reiterate, Jesus begins by calling disciples, and this is the final thing he says to them. He says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And I'll go with you, always till the very end of the age. So he begins by saying, hey, come and find out what I'm a part of. Come be a disciple. And he ends by saying, okay, go make disciples. Do you feel how, like, utterly simple that is? He doesn't say, all right, let's take up an offering so we can build a church. (laughs) I mean, I'm not against these things, by the way. But he doesn't, he doesn't say, make sure you set up a nice hierarchical system, and here are the five doctrines that you need. And he just says, go make disciples. And he says, I'll go with you in a kind of a mysterious way. He doesn't actually say how, but he's like, I'll be with you in spirit. I'll go with you to the very end of the age, but all you have to do is do the thing that we've been doing, which is go make disciples. So the first question I have is, what is that? What is a disciple? And that might be, you know, I could, you know, we could talk for the next hour or the next 10 years about such a question. By the way, I, I used to be an evangelical pastor, so 20 minutes isn't long enough for any kind of talk. So I'll, I'll try to be, so I'm not saying that's better. You know, 50 minutes, you're like, whoa, this is a lot. Um, in any case, what can we say in just a few minutes about the essence of being a disciple? And I, and, and I want to say a few things. And I want to start, of all things, with a kind of history lesson because I can't help it, and that's my background, and that's interesting to me, so I'll try to make it interesting to you. Because here's something that's true about the word disciple and rabbi that's associated with it. So Jesus is the rabbi, and, and, and of course the, the disciples are the disciples. Is that it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. There are no rabbis. Anywhere in the first half of the thing, the Bible, that's you know sitting under your pew. No mention of disciples, No mention of rabbis. It's completely new. It seems to come out of the blue. That's the the first take. And we would want to be curious about that. Well, where did that come from and why? Why why was this suddenly important in the first century? And, And of course, if we know a little bit of information about that, we can then ask, why would Jesus say, this is the thing I want you to carry forward? So here's my brief history lesson. (laughs) In five, I'm sorry, there are a lot of young people today like, oh, great, here we go. (laughs) In 586 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. So this was Solomon's temple, if you're familiar with any of the Old Testament narrative here. 
So Solomon built the temple. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. And the Jews were taken into exile. This is actually in the Old Testament. This whole story is in the Old Testament. The Jews are taken into exile. And interestingly enough, they do fairly well in Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians get conquered by the Persians. The Persians make um, Judaism or the, the religion of the Israelites legal. So the Jews are allowed to return back home. They rebuild the temple. But interestingly enough, most of the Jews stayed in Babylon for a long, long time. There are still some Jews in Iraq today, in fact, all the way from 586 B.C. In any case, they faced a serious problem. And here was the problem. How does our religion survive when we have no temple and no place and no land? That is not an easy question. No temple, no place to go, no land that's our own. How are we going to survive? You know what happened to most ancient peoples who were conquered and their religion? They disappeared. They assimilated into the, whatever the local religion was. They disappeared. Their traditions disappeared. And that's what Judaism faced in 586 B.C. What they decided to do was turn their attention to this thing that we call the Bible, or the Torah. They called it the Torah. And they said, okay, if we have no temple, we have no place to gather anymore, and priests don't really matter, what's a priest going to do out there in Babylon? He's got nothing to do. There are no animals to cut up, no burnt sacrifices. What are we going to do? They said, let's turn our attention to the text. And that's exactly what they did. They started copying it memorizing it, having conversations about it, arguing about it. I don't know if you've ever met any Jewish people, but arguing about the Torah, making a, a central part of their communal life. They even started gathering in small settings, which later they called the Bet Knesset, which gets translated into Greek as the synagogue. So the synagogues were born in exile, and all a synagogue was was a gathering place. This is a synagogue, by technical definition, a place where people assemble. And what do they do? They look at this text, they read things, they talk about it, they wonder about it, they argue about it, and they make, make that central. And right during this time, the people who happen to be pretty good at talking about the Torah and interpreting the Torah, how do we keep these laws later came to be called rabbis. And all a rabbi was was a term of respect. It's not a formal, they didn't go to seminary like rabbi seminary or something. It's just whoever in the community had a certain foundation in the text, had good interpretations of the Torah, was a model person, that was the rabbi. And then if you were um, wanting to study with the rabbi, you could do so. And thus you have the system of rabbi-disciple. So when Jesus comes onto the scene, when people start calling him rabbi, we know right away he's an expert in the Torah. And he's like living a life that is worthy of, of emanating in some way. And if you like that sort of thing, you're attracted to it, you be, can become a disciple of that particular rabbi. Now there's, by the way, a slight difference. Most of the time, you started following a rabbi usually around the age of like 14, something like that. It's the, just, I'm just giving you general numbers from like, it's a bit, scholarship is a bit tricky when it comes to this question, how old were the disciples, but most of the time it's young people who begin a life following a rabbi around. It's not like 40-year-old guys with beards, like, all right, Jesus, let's go do something. I mean, mo more than likely, the disciples who are fishing are just young people, and then they get to follow Jesus around for a while. They learn from him. They put into practice his teachings, that sort of thing. Have I made sense? Now, here's the simplest definition I can give you as, as, uh, as to what a disciple is. The word is talmid in, in Hebrew, if you want to mean, if you want to know it, uh, the word, but it means student. Now, that's not like a big shock, I'm sure, but think about the difference between being a student and an expert. <laughs> and what Jesus is saying is, I want students. And the very last thing he says to his students is, go find more students. He doesn't say, okay, now you get to graduate and we're gonna, I'm going to give you a, sp a special wand that's going to be your rabbi wand, and now you're an expert. He says, no, remain students. Jesus, think about Jesus' line. Unless you change and become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I have kids, you know, um, so I know everything I, okay, I'll just be more direct. 
what is a kid? You know, how does a how does a kid move and operate in the world? Well, with a lot of curiosity, a lot of wonder, a lot of questions, a lot of challenges. I don't know if you know, my kids, you know, they don't always listen, all right? But that kind of spirit is what Jesus is saying, this is the center of my movement. I want students. I want them to be like kids. <laughs> I want them to be open and curious and learn and put this stuff into practice. And that's my big idea for spreading the gospel. And he leaves it at that. You go do it. And apparently, they took it seriously enough that you're here. <laughs> they took that model seriously enough that you and I are somehow a part of this. Our, disi our disciples in our own way. So you can begin to ask yourself questions like, well, what's my relationship with being a student of this? By the way, I think churches might fare a little better. You know the fastest growing group of, of um, the fastest growing group in, in America are the nuns, not like the nuns with habits, but like the, those who have no particular religious affiliation. Are you familiar with that? The fastest growing group of, and, and most of those people who might call themselves spiritual but not religious, by the way, I'm not against this, you know, I'm, I'm just saying this is a major group of people don't want anything to do with religious gatherings, religious organization, or any kind of organized religion. And you can ask yourself, why? <laughs> you probably know the answers. But here's one possibility, because hardly any of them are acting like students. <laughs> We're much more prone to act like we have the truth and nobody else does. We're the experts. You're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Not you, of course. You wouldn't send out this vibe, but others have been known to send out this vibe, okay? But it's, it's like we haven't listened very well to the final words that Jesus says, just go be a student, try it, learn it, put it into practice. I trust that you can do these things. You can embody these teachings. You go love your neighbor as yourself. That's very hard to do. I don't even like my actual neighbor all that much, to tell you the truth. I mean, my, I mean I'm serious. Uh, he's not here, so I can say this. But <laughs> it's difficult. But he says, you go do it. And how are you going to go do it? You, you be a student of these things. You try. You try it. You put it on. You embody this. You carry it forward. I'll be with you in some mysterious way, but it's, it's for you to carry. And it seems that Jesus trusts that such a thing is so countercultural that it doesn't matter what the spiritual climate is, what the political climate is, who's ruling, who's ruling where, where the power systems are. For most of Christianity, it just flowed like an underground river. And you and I can be a part of that. So what's your relationship like with just being a student? Just putting one foot in front of the other. Am I making sense? Okay. Um, okay, one more piece here. I want to end with a little story. It's a story that probably all of you have heard. And I want to just sort of draw out a couple of, of, of things that I hear in this story, at least. So, the Sea of Galilee is a lake. I, I know it sounds kind of fancy, the Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake. You have lakes in Minnesota that are probably ten times the size of the Sea of Galilee. So, um, but it's, it's significant in, in this respect. It's about 600 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by mountains. And some of those mountains are almost 1,000 feet above sea level. So weird things happen with the weather because of the altitude. And so it's not uncommon for just this little lake to have a big storm whip up. I've been there many times during a, a storm. And that's, this is what happens to the disciples. They're fishermen. They know the lake. They know what they're doing. Okay, they're out there, and they're traveling from one town to the next by boat along the shore, which was very common. They all grew up doing this. But it's a storm, and it says the wind is against them, so they're like rowing. I'm sure they're saying, what are we even doing out here? It's ridiculous or whatever. Young kids are likely to say. Whatever kind of cuss words were available in Hebrew, they're rowing. Okay? And they're making their way along the shore, and Jesus is not there, and which is classic. He's often MIA in situations like this. Even, even sometimes the disciples come looking for him. They can't find Jesus. He heals somebody, he runs away. He feeds people, he hides in the mountains. He's got this very sort of like appear, disappear sort of relationship with crowds. And he's not there. They're rowing along. And then it says something interesting. It's night, 
and it says Jesus comes out to them walking on the lake. <laughs> and in the, one of the Gospels, maybe Mark, it says, and he was about to pass them by, which I always think is a little bit funny. I don't, it's like, hey, you know, just, just <laughs> go this way now. And so anyway, it's a bit of an odd scene. And my guess is none of the disciples that had ever seen anyone walking on water, so they're freaked out. They think it's a ghost. They're scared. They're frightened. They're in the boat. And Peter says something very interesting. Peter says to Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the lake. And Jesus says, okay, come. Which echoes the very first thing he said to Peter, except Peter didn't have a question. Jesus said to him, come follow me. And then, however, I don't know, a couple years later, they're in this boat. And Peter says, if it's you, Tell me to come out to you on the lake. Now, pause for a moment and just remember, a disciple is a student, and one of the things they're meant to do is follow the rabbi around and learn from him and put into practice whatever he's teaching and to be like him. So it's a very simple question, um, or it's a very simple answer to the question, why is Peter doing that? Because he's trying to be like Jesus. It's like that straightforward all right, if this thing is real, and I'm really a disciple, all right, let's find out. And I'll, I'll follow you in this sense. I'll try it. And you probably know the story. He gets out of the boat, and maybe it works for a second. I mean, it doesn't exactly say. It's like it appears to work for a moment, and then he starts sinking. And I don't think any of the other 11 were that surprised. Like, okay, yeah, that, this is what happens, all right? <laughs> And Peter sinks, and then Jesus reaches out his hand and pulls him back up and, and says those famous words, O oh, you of little faith. And I remember hearing that as a kid, and I thought, oh, Jesus is kind of like criticizing Peter. He's sort of saying like, you know, you should have believed more or something like that. Or, um, you know, or probably what I was hearing is, you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> something like that. But I don't really hear it that way anymore. In fact, I think something else is going on about the nature of the relationship between the rabbi and the disciple. In one sense, I think Jesus is quite proud of Peter for doing such a thing. Guess who's not doing it? All of the 11, you know? They're like, you go first, you know? We'll find out what happens. So Peter has, in a way, tremendous courage to give this a try. And, and he fails. And that's also not a problem to Jesus. He just says, okay, you don't have that much faith, fine. And he pulls him back up again. So to me, the essence of being a student in this respect, from, that's what I hear in this story, is just try. <laughs> that's it. Just try. And guess what? It's not always going to go that well. And that's also okay. Jesus is the kind of person who reaches out a hand. What could Jesus have done? You know, he could have been like, all right, Peter, you know, <laughs> but... I don't know how Jesus would mock Peter, but that's what I was trying to do, you know, like, oh, you can't swim, you know, wherever, I don't know. <laughs> but that's not it at all. He just says, all right, try again, and pulls him back up again. And I think in a way, probably the arrest of the 11 felt more embarrassed than Peter did, you know, at least he said, well, I did it, <laughs> you know. So I think there's something powerful about what Jesus is offering here and why this story is recorded in the Gospels, that in a sense, no matter what the age is like, like Jesus says, I'll go with you to the end of the age, no matter what the news cycle is constantly spinning through, the invitation is very simple. Just be a student here. Just be a student. Like, what's the difference between this row of kids in their first communion and you? I'd say nothing. <laughs> Not really, you know. We're just students. We're in this together. Jesus, by the way, says, let no one on earth call you rabbi. Let no one on earth call you rabbi. If you have one rabbi, the Messiah. That means we're all students. You're a disciple. I'm a disciple. You have some faith. You know, your neighbor has less faith. It doesn't matter, you know. And one more P.S. Oftentimes when we hear the word faith, like, because Jesus says, oh, you have little faith, we think, usually think about belief. That's the way most Westerners hear that. They're like, oh, yeah, faith is what you believe. Like, if I said, you know, I believe the Vikings are going to win the Super Bowl. 
you'd say, that guy has a lot of faith, all right? <laughs> wow, what a believer, all right? That's how we ordinarily think about it, but that's not really so much like the, the way the, the Hebrew people thought about faith. In fact, Abraham is called a person of faith because he left his family, his country, and his father and went to a land that he had never heard of before. There's always an action component to it. I'm not saying belief is unimportant. Belief is, you know, belief is fine. It's kind of like an on-ramp, but it's an on-ramp for what? It's an on-ramp for action. It's for like taking like just one step out of the boat. That's it. And Jesus says, if you have even faith, or we might translate action, that's as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That comes right out of the mouth of Jesus. So, yeah. This feels like a good place to stop. So, I want to end with a benediction. I want to end with a benediction uh, that's, uh, uh, I've come to learn, is common here. But I'll tell you a little history about it. It's called Aaron's Benediction. And my archaeology professor in, in graduate school found a, a very tiny scroll in a tomb around the neck of a woman. And it was a very tiny scroll, and he was unsure how to unravel it. Because, I mean, I don't know when the last time you unraveled a silver scroll was, especially an ancient one. And so he had to get some lasers, and he was able to cut the scroll, and he very carefully unrolled it. And this is what it said on the scroll. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you shalom. Peace. Thanks for listening. Amen. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Now you know why I wanted them to come here. It's so good. Um, we're going to respond as we always do. We're going to have a time of giving, so thanks for being generous. We're going to have a, a song play, and uh, we already did communion. But um, yeah, just uh, not to put you know, too fine a point on it, but if you have nothing else to reflect on, I, I just I love this idea of us putting into practice at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, hey, anyone who puts these words into practice. So what's one way? Like, just What's one way this week you can put these words of Jesus or any of the words you know into practice. Kent's going to be hanging around if you want to talk to him after the service, but uh, we'll close with that in song and giving some. Moon and stars, they went. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was Father. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon
we stand. So I'm going to close with a benediction as well. I'm going to change it up a little bit, though, so I don't just repeat what Kent said, because you've already been blessed by Kent. So, But, it, you know, uh, when I first heard Kent, I was like, man, you remind me of this teacher that we used to listen to at Central named Ray Vanderlyn, and some of his videos, and uh, he does a video, this guy Ray Vanderlyn, on, on rabbis and disciples, and Kent was like, oh, yeah, I've studied with, with Ray. He was like, they were friends. I'm like, oh, that's great. But uh, Ray has this video, it's called the Dust, and he was talking about how when these disciples and rabbis would come into town, these these followers, these students would follow so close to the rabbi, they'd often arrive into town just like covered in like the dirt and the dust of the roads. You know, they'd, come, they'd just be caked in dust from these rabbis because they'd be kicking up dust. And you can imagine these little, you know, these little students running behind the rabbi. And so this ancient, this, this saying came out amongst the sages and the wise ones that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. So Central Lutheran Church this morning, may you hear the words of Jesus and the teachings and the instructions, and may you put them into practice. May it be that simple. And may you know in the deepest parts of your souls you are God's beloved sons and God's beloved daughters. And may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. If you've got to sneak out, you can go ahead and be dismissed. Otherwise, you can hang out and sing with us. And uh, otherwise, go in peace and serve the Lord. I read.